and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's inaugural New York Jewish Book Festival. Um, this event is on RBG's Brave and Brilliant Women, 33 Jewish Women to Inspire Everyone with Nadine Epstein and Amy B. Scher. We hope you will explore the 32 events that are happening throughout the museum today, meet some of the 85 speakers, and get books signed at one of the 72 author signings in our main lobby and events hall on the second floor. While you are here, we also encourage you to take the time to visit our exhibitions, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, on the main level, and Survivors' Faces of Life After the Holocaust, photographs by Martin Schuller on the third floor. Andy Goldsworthy's Garden of Stones is also worth a visit, just outside of our wonderful Cafe Locks. So the whole museum is open to you today. Um, you can also pick up holiday gifts and books at the Pickman Museum shop and visitor services on the main level. We are encouraging people to wear masks in the museum, and we hope you will share feedback with us in our post-festival survey, which will be in your inboxes tomorrow. This program is made possible in part by support from the Battery Park City Authority. Your donations also help us present these programs. This event is co-presented by Moment Magazine. And now I'm glad to introduce you to our speakers. Nadine Epstein is an award-winning journalist and essayist, an editor-in-chief and CEO of Moment Magazine. She hosts The Road to Gender Equality, a series of far-reaching conversations exploring long-term strategies to ensure women's rights in the US, and co-hosts The Wide River Project, a series exploring the complexities of black Jewish relationships with Eric Ward. Her books include uh, Ellie Wiesel, An Extraordinary Life and Legacy, Writings, Photographs, and Reflections, and Spiritual Bathing, Healing Rituals, and Traditions from Around the World. Her articles and essays have been published in Moment, The Washington Post, The New York Times, The New York Times Magazine, Smithsonian, and Newsweek, among other publications. She is a mixed media artist and creator of the Eyeshadow Project. Amy B. Scher is the award-winning and best-selling author of the How to Heal Yourself When No One Else Can series, which has been translated into over 20 languages, and her memoir, This Is How I Saved My Life, which details her battle with chronic Lyme disease, her journey to India for an experimental medical treatment, and the Eat, Pray, Love-like adventure that followed. Her work has appeared in the Washington Post, Cosmopolitan, Good Morning America, CNN, CBS, Oprah Daily, and more. She lives in New York City with her wife and their bad cat. Um, RBG's Brave and Brilliant Women, 33 Jewish Women to Inspire Everyone, is available for purchase in our Pickman Museum shop and lobby, and Nadine will sign copies for a half hour after the event in the resource area in the events hall on the second floor. Now please welcome Nadine and Amy. Thank you so much, everyone. It is my honor to be here and talk about this special book, RBG's Brave and Brilliant Women, which I hope everybody gets a copy of or has a copy of. Um, it's gotten so much well-deserved praise, and authors never um, brag about their own books, so I'm going to do it for Nadine and read a little bit of the praise, um, and then we'll get on to our discussion. Forbes said, this charming book provides unique insight not only into what the justice was pondering in the final year of her life and the heroines that helped shape her worldview, but in the legacy she wanted to leave behind. Tablet Magazine named it one of the best Jewish children's books of 2021, and it was also on the list of School Library Journal's best books of 2021, and they said, whether reading from cover to cover or just browsing, kids will find inspiration in the lives of these brave and brilliant women, and I couldn't agree more. So I know you all came here to hear Nadine and to hear us talk about her book, but you also probably have your own burning questions, so we are going to chat, and then we'll have plenty of time for you to ask whatever is on your mind. Um, but first, Nadine, I'm so excited to talk to you about this truly Thank brave and beautiful book. Thank you for doing this today. Of course. So I know that this is kind of dubbed as a children's book, but I think it's an intergenerational book. I know this is going to be reading material at my own family's Jewish holidays. And so I wanted to know what your what was your intention with this book and what is your hope for it now? Sometimes things change as books come Well, out. it was always, I think, going to be an intergenerational book. And I think it actually says it's ages 10 through 120. Although I just actually met with 55 third graders earlier this week, and they were like 8 and 9. And it turns out they... They were, they were really good with the book, too. So, um, but it's really, so 
how did the story of this book happen? Is that um, Justice Ginsburg was a reader of Moment Magazine, and I'm the editor in chief of Moment Magazine, and we have our books and opinion editor over there too, Amy Schwartz, today, who's also presenting this afternoon with a wonderful panel about AI and Judaism. But um, we were um, Justice Ginsburg and I were just were we honored her actually, 2019 September 2019. September 18th, 2019, which happened to be one year to the date before she died. And we gave her this beautiful collar called a Zedek collar. And then she asked me to bring it to her in her chambers, and so I did. And while we were there, we were talking about the women who really sustained her during her life. And they were Jewish women, women she had learned about. Like, I'm looking at Emma Lazarus, because I'm looking out over here at the Statue of Liberty. Um, and Henrietta Zold, who was far more than the, the founder of Adassa, and um, Lillian Wald. So she just started listing women that had meant a lot to her. And so I said something which I say all the time, uh, either in my head or out loud, which is, hey, we should write a book about this. And <laughs> she said, in her very, very kind of deadpan way, yes. And there we were on this journey to write this book. And we had no idea, of course, it was going to be, <laughs> we, we had no idea it was going to be the, COVID was happening, and it was going to be the last year of her life. And, but we, we started this process, and we ended up choosing about 150 women to cover, to put in the book. And as you can see, it ended up with uh, 33. <laughs> we, were, we were actually going to aim for 36, but things didn't work out that way. So, um, anyways, that was sort of the beginning of the book. So, I loved personally reading it because there were some women that I wasn't as familiar with and some yes. that I knew, and that was a big surprise for me in the book that it wasn't only the women we know so much about, but it brought light to women that maybe had been sort of not lost to history, but lost to some of us who... Lost to history, yeah, often. Yeah, yeah. And, and it really brought it really brought an educational aspect to the book. Well, she was very, you know, kind of really angry that women, and I, and I am too, that women throughout history haven't had the same, they weren't recorded in history. Mm -hmm. So there were some women that were her favorite women and that she just thought about and cared about. Some she'd learned about her mom, from her mom. Some she had met during her lifetime. And then there were other women that I knew about that I thought were really important to add to the book. So it ended up being, because all her women would have been lawyers, writers, and opera singers. <laughs> and then I was like, well, we need some other women too. So I, and women from different periods of history, we needed more diversity. So I added a bunch of women. And then I learned about her women because I had never heard of some of her women. And she learned about my women because she had never heard of most of them. So we ended up kind of, it, it became the two of us here. So. Can you share one or two of the women that you included? Oh my gosh. Well, I can tell you some of her favorite. I'll tell Perfect. you, let me tell you, start by telling you some of her favorite women. So the first thing she said was, oh, we have to have the women of the Haggadah. And I was like, the women of the Haggadah, they're, you know, I was kind of taken aback by that. And she said, no, no, Miriam, Yaakov, Pharaoh's daughter, Shifra and Pua, the midwives, they have to be in the book. And I was like, well, why? And she said, well, they, and I said, also, is even, you know, Batya, is daughter of the Pharaoh Jewish? And she said, it doesn't matter whether she's Jewish or not. These are the women who made, you know, J Jewish, Jews endure. This is why Jews survived. They helped the Jews survive. They have to be in the book. Um, and it turns out, by the way, that I didn't really realize. She didn't, neither of us knew that, you know, Midrash says that Batya is actually Jewish. She then marries a Jew and then leaves Egypt with the Israelites. Um, she also cared a huge amount about Emma Lazarus, um, Fanny Mendelssohn, who was Felix Mendelssohn's sister, who was actually supposed to be a more talented composer and performer than Felix was, but she wasn't allowed to publish her music or perform by her father, or by Felix, by that matter. And oh, Justice Ginsburg felt that was an incredible injustice. Um, she loved Henrietta Zold. Um, she loved Gertrude Berg. She wanted Rita Levy Montalcini in the book. She had a Nobel Prize winner in medicine. She had met her. Um, she 
She, she wanted Nadine Gordimer in the book, Roberta Peters, Anne Frank. Oh, she loved Anne Frank. And she made me actually, I reread Anne Frank and realized what a feminist she was. Because, you know, I read Anne Frank as a kind of a young girl, and we all do that. We usually read Anne when we're younger. But then when you go back and you read her, you realize, one, she's a really good writer. And two, she's really a feminist and really interesting. Um, so those were some of, and then Roberta Peters. Because Roberta Peters, who I'd never heard of, was an opera singer here in New York. And um, Justice Ginsburg grew up like listening to her and loved her. Just like she loved Gertrude Berg because she heard Gertrude Berg, listened to Gertrude Berg on the radio when she was playing, writing and performing Molly Goldberg. So, um, and then uh, she wanted Muriel Faye Siebert in the book. And Muriel, I wanted Muriel Faye Siebert in the book too. It was the one, she was the one woman we both met, had both had met. Well, Justice Ginsburg had met a few of these women, and I, this is the only woman in the book I had met. <laughs> and that was simply because when I was about 19, I was on a train between Philadelphia and New York, and there was an empty seat next to me, and uh, who sat down next to me but Muriel Faye Siebert, who I didn't know who she was, but she had been in a helicopter crash that day and had decided to take the train home from New York to wherever she was going in New Jersey. And she um, told me her life story. She was really amazing. She gave me her business card and said, call me. And then being a 19-year-old idiot, I never did. But um, so some of the women I wanted in the book that, and that I think are really important are Salome Alexandra. I mean, we, this is a woman who was a queen of Judea. We know all about King Solomon and King David and King this and King that. But this is a really wise leader who was actually written about by Greek historians about her amazing rule. And after, of course, after she died, her sons took over and they were the end of the line. Um, but she was very important for all sorts of reasons. Um, Gracia Mendes Nasi, who uh, was an amazing 16th century, the richest woman in the world, a shipping magnet, in an era where women weren't even allowed to, you know, own a thing, <laughs> they, they didn't even really own themselves. Um, she owned all these, this, this big company, and she used her wealth to save Jews from the Inquisition, and that's a pretty amazing thing to do. And then she even um, really, we're talking about decades before Herzl, she then um, basically founds with a um, sultan, Ottoman sultan, she, she buys land, and she um, founds a, um, a homeland for Jews in Tiberias so that she's resettling Jews from the Inquisition there. And we just don't talk about that. You know, I, I, get, I get sort of mad when I hear about people talking about Herzl. Yes, he invented political Zionism, but the idea, there were a number of women talking about this and doing about this way before he got there, and one of them was Henrietta Sold also. Um, we both loved Ernestine Rose. Ernestine Rose was an amazing, fiery speaker who, when she was 16 years old in a little town in Poland, her dad is a rabbi. He basically, her mom dies, leaves her some money. Her dad gives that money, puts that money aside to give to her husband, who soon-to-be husband, who he's arranged marriage for her. She doesn't want to marry him, and she wants her money, and she wants her freedom. So she goes to, her dad's like, the, the rabbi in the town. So she goes to the next town, goes to court, the civil court, acts as her own lawyer, wins her case, gets her freedom, gets her money, takes just enough money to be able to leave and be, um, go to Berlin and gives the rest of the money back to her dad, becomes an entrepreneur in Europe, marries a man that she wants to, who she wants to marry, comes to the United States and one of the co-founders along with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton of the suffragist movement here. But we don't know anything about her. She just has completely lost into, she's lost to obscurity now. And um, I think we need to make a big blockbuster film about her. She's just so amazing. Um, so Florence Prague Kahn, first Jewish congressman in the United States, really an amazing woman um, from San Francisco. The essence of bipartisanism uses humor to be to basically achieve power. I mean, she's like a brilliant woman, but she uses humor, and she's very bipartisan, and she's very interesting. Um, Regina Jonas, the first rabbi uh, in Berlin, Rosalind Franklin, 
on and on. So there's just so many amazing women that are in the book. And we have another 120 sitting around, 117 that we didn't get to do. There's never enough pages, yes. right? And always too many words. I love to hear you read that list because that I sort of had that experience all over again of when I read the book and was thinking, how do I not know about some of these people? Yeah. But that's why this book is so important. And I'm sure everyone here listening to that list was thinking the same. So what was the writing process like? I know when people ask me, I just want to like cover my eyes and run away. So <laughs> I'm sorry to ask you that as a fellow writer, but I'm especially curious how the collaboration with the justice worked and how that kind of played out. Well, first of all, this book was, I just want to say, it was, I think, really important to her because it was part of her legacy. And she didn't think she was going to die. I thought she, she thought she could make it more, longer. She had beat cancer a lot. And so, um, but this is something that she really wanted to share, the stories of these women. And it's a lot about her and her thinking. She really wanted to share this, move it forward. Um, well... <laughs> You know, again, I'm, I already, when we were having this conversation, um, it was kind of a crazy thing because, you know, I already have three full-time jobs as editor-in-chief of the magazine, I'm CEO of the magazine, executive director of the nonprofit, and a lot of other things, and that's, those are a lot, that's a lot to do. So, and she was Supreme Court Justice, so we were busy. We both had day jobs. And um, so doing this book was kind of a, was something we were just doing as an add-on. And when it came up, of course, once we decided to do it, I was like, of course I have to do this book. I mean, even, first of all, I, I said it, yes, she said yes, we had to do this book. Um, but also, it was a really terrible time to be doing a book, COVID, and she was sick. Um, so it took a long time to choose the women, um, it took to research them, and then I had to um, talk to Random House about the book, and so it's suddenly July of 2020. And I really haven't started writing the book. And um, I rented a house in kind of high COVID. I rented a cabin in Virginia to go and so I could just be, and a friend came with me just to sit down and start really focusing on the book. The day I get to the cabin, I get an email from Justice Ginsburg saying, I'm ready to read the book today. <laughs> <laughs> and at which point I was like, I mean, I just, it, I, I just like died. And I said, well, could I have 10 more? I, I didn't even know she wanted to read the whole book. She, she wanted to pick the women, and she was going she to, she wrote the introduction. But I hadn't really thought about the fact that she might want to read the whole book. And, um, but it turns out she wanted to. And so I, I then kind of politely wrote back, well, could I have two more weeks? And she said, how about 10 days? <laughs> and she said, because she, she, she said, I have a little break in the action right now, but in August, I'll have to be preparing for the Supreme Court term, and I have a lot of homework to do. And this is a woman who really did her homework. Now, we're talking, this is, you know, this is two months before she dies, but she's totally focused on the, first of all, on the book, and then also on getting ready for the next term. And so um, I sat down and wrote the fastest first draft of a book that you could possibly write, and then I had to, I mean, it was no first, nothing, you can write nothing in, at least the, I did the bios. You can write, I can't, I'm not such a fast writer. I just wrote these drafts. And then I tried to, you know, make sure that they were spell checked. And then I sent them to her. And then another, like two weeks later, came back, um, let's put it, a manuscript that had every page had maybe 20 comments on it. Have uh, words crossed out. Don't use that word. I disagree. What was your, you know, wh what is your, uh, what is your source on this? I mean, it was just on and on and on and on and on. And my first, um, I, I printed it out, and my my first reaction was simply to cry, and I felt so ashamed because I was like, and she she so she said, when we started the book, she goes, you know, I know everything you do is really good, and you're really good writer and you're really professional and I'm so happy to do this with you. And then I felt like I disappointed her. But after about a day or two of just feeling terrible, I realized that every single note, every little comment was a clue about her. I learned so much about her from every word choice that she made. And every time she, 
she changed, I wrote some interesting verb and she changed it to earned or gained. It was slightly more legalese, <laughs> um, but every little detail um, was really useful. And then I also figured out later, which I didn't realize, that she edited me just the way she edited any of her law clerks, and which was very extensively and very no-nonsense. She didn't waste any time with um, sort of the, the famous editor line, oh, this is a really great first draft, but you know, here are my comments. She didn't bother with that comment. She just went on and on, you know, just hundreds and hundreds of comments. <laughs> so um, I learned a lot, and I actually ended up, you know, rewriting that, the whole thing, you know, many, many, many times. And I want to thank Amy over there, because Amy was one of the very, very helpful in who knows a great deal more about Judaism than I do, and who really helped with catching a lot and doing, helping a lot at the last minute. Um, so then, suddenly, September 18th, um, Justice Ginsburg dies. And I'm completely caught off guard. Now, I know she has cancer. I know that had come back. But she hadn't really led on outside her very, very inner circle because she didn't want anyone to know, really. She thought she could make it, and she didn't want the word to get out. So like people who were really like her family knew, and Nina Totenberg knew, and a few other people knew. And she gave me some little hints, but I hadn't picked up on all those little hints. So when she died, I was just like completely, besides devastated, just shocked. And um, so um, from there, um, I added the first part of the book. I wanted her to be in the book, so I added a whole chapter about her. And then I added the call to action, which she and I had talked about. And it was very, so I have to say this book, um, I'm so glad we did it, but it was really hard to, it was really hard to do for all sorts of reasons. Yeah, I love to hear about your writing process because I think I sometimes get the question, how long does it take to write a book? And I say, as long as you have. I've written it in three months when somebody tells me it's due in three months. And guess what? If they tell me it takes, I have Years. a year. I take it here. You know, you yes. just so your sounds very familiar, and and the edits on the page where your stomach sinks, and but it sounds like her edits were so so, so formative for what the book became. Well, I just learned a lot about her, and I learned a lot about her throughout the whole process, and I learned a lot about her through my whole kind of relationship with her, my friendship with her. You know, I learned she. I mean, this book, in a way, is about role models, and she definitely is and was a role model for me. I mean, I learned lesson after lesson from her. Uh, one, to have higher expectations and standards. Um, I think that I always was of the opinion, I think once I told her, well, I don't know, this is years and years ago, it would be so great to get to the place where we have, you know, half the Supreme Court is made, out of, made up of women. And boy, did she take my head off and said, what about nine? There's been, there's been nine men for centuries, and no one's made a fuss about that. And it's time to have nine women. And I was like, you're absolutely correct. But you know, I had never really gotten that far in my thinking. And she, she really um, she, she, she helped me. That was huge. That's so, she's so right. I mean, I, I'm such a believer in women, women leadership. Women, women bring something to power that's really important or different traits to power that are really important. Now, that's not to say that some men don't have some of those traits, but we've had a long, long time of, of male rule and we could use some women, way more women. In fact, a majority of women. And Justice Ginsburg would have said, how about all women for a while? And she's, she's got a big point there. Uh, she also forced me to kind of get out of my shell a little bit. Like, I, I didn't like to... I was really shy. I was, I was shy. And so I didn't, and I think I told her, I said, ah, one day, and again, I don't know why I said this. Well, one reason I like being a journalist is because I can be behind the scenes. And she said, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> she said, if you don't get out there and speak your mind, no one's going to speak your mind for you. And I went, wow, she's so right. So, you know, I went and started singing getting singing lessons, and then I had to go take public speaking lessons, and then I had to go take improv lessons, and then I had to take stand-up lessons, and you know, I had to force myself to get out there, and I'm so glad I did, and it's all because of Justice Ginsburg, so thank you. <laughs>
You've written such a variety of books. I was looking at all the amazing different books. Some are in healing, some are, I mean, you have such a variety of books. And I just wonder, did you always want to be a writer? And, and was, if so, was there a specific writer or just person in your family or life that inspired you? Oh, no one's ever asked me that. Um, <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I think that um, I just always was a writer. I was always an artist and a writer. I was always that nerdy kid who was really good at, you know, drawing and doing art and who read every book in the library and who wrote poems. And I just grew up that way. And, but I, I've always been so many, I mean, I, I find it hard to be any one thing. I find it hard to be just a writer. I find it hard just to be an artist. I find it hard just to be an activist. I find it hard just to be a journalist. I never, I'm always trying to figure out like, well, what, what I am, am I? And I've sort of given up. I just, who I am. <laughs> so, um, and I kept, there were, there were so many, I think I was tremendously influenced because, and when I was in f third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, I read every single biography in my elementary school library. And of which 10 were women and 340 were men. <laughs> and all of those people became part of me, and one of my favorites was Louisa May Alcott. You know, they all, all those biographies just are like imprinted in who I am. So I feel like I'm, except for the sports people, I'm you know, I got all of it. <laughs> Science, <laughs> the sports people, the sports autobiography, the sports biographies didn't really hit me at the time. They might now, but all the other biographies are just part of me. I think that. It's so inspiring what you said about having a hard time being one thing because we don't have to be as women. And I think a lot of us grew up or with society saying, pick a lane. What are you? Are you going to be a mother? Are you going to be a writer? Are you going to be an accountant? What are you going to be? And I think women are stepping into their power more, especially sort of in this century around, I can be so many things. And I love to hear women say that. Well, I think Justice Ginsburg and I agree that it was very important to... I mean, I think role models are incredibly important. I mean, we're always learning. What's a role model? It's somebody who we admire some tra their traits, something that we want to incorporate in ourselves. And that happens when we're kids, if we think about it. I mean, we might not be thinking about it, but it happens unconsciously. But it really has to happen throughout our whole life. I mean, I'm constantly meeting people, whether they're writers or artists or the bus driver or whoever it is, where I find something so so special about them, and I, I want to make that part of me, too. Um, I want to learn from them, so um, I feel like it's really important. So one of the ideas here for when I, when I work with kids about the book is that I really want them to think that you can have not just one role model, and role models come from, they can be historical, they can be in your family, they can be somebody, pop culture, but you have to really think about what it is that you want to learn from them. And then, in this book, for example, you have 33 women, and you can choose something from all of them, because there's no such thing as, like, you know, we're not, we're not talking about worshiping somebody or, or adulation. We're talking about learning from them. One of the things that I thought really brought extra life to this book, just reading was a, such, a, such a special experience, but the illustrations are absolutely stunning and just brings so much more to the book. And I wanted to hear about the illustrator and how you how you found the illustrator, B. Johnson, is it? Is yes, it such a great question. Thank you. Um, so we Moment actually um, we publish books, and you'll see today also two books we have here today. One is uh, Amy's book that she did, Can Robots Be Jewish? And Other Pressing Questions of Modern Life. And then Bob Meinkoff, the former New, York, New, York, New Yorker cartoonist, we published one of his, a book with him, which is called Have I Got a Cartoon for You? Um, and this book, which was happening during COVID, we were going to originally publish it through Moment Books. But we were, so much was going on with COVID and just keeping the magazine going. So we partnered with Random House. And Random House, the editor was so wonderful she let me choose the illustrator. She gave me a whole selection of illustrators and said, pick who you want. And this was the, I, I wanted this sort of kind of elegant, I didn't want it to be cartoony. I wanted it to be really elegant and um, beautiful. And B. Johnson, who, this was her COVID project and who lives in Brooklyn, 
did such a gorgeous job and spent so much time researching these women. And some of them, you know, we don't even know how they really looked. She's basing them off paintings of people's imagining of what they looked, looked like. But I think she just did a gorgeous job. And I, I have to say Random House also spent a lot of time just designing this book and did a, did a, a beautiful job on it. It really is beautiful. And yeah, and, and you know, in a book like that, I sort of expected maybe there would be pictures or, and, and like you said, there aren't pictures of all these women, but I thought how amazing I could even see all those 33 women on a poster. I mean, it's just the artwork is so... That's a great idea. Yeah, all the, all the artwork on its own is so beautiful and inspiring. And then when you pair the words with them, of course, even more power. But I just loved, I love the artwork. And I, lo and I think your vision really came out because I could see kids being drawn to them, but they're not, the illustrations are not cartoony. So it's those illustrations will will bring everyone in. So it's really interesting because this re book really, um, I think the main people who buy this book are people who are women, are women and men in their, you know, 50, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s in a way. They're buying it to share with their grandkids, but they're really sending, buying it for each other um, because <laughs> it's not written... We did, I didn't want to write it down to kids. And it's really hard to do that with Justice Ginsburg anyways. I mean, I thought it was just written in a regular, regular language, um, so it could be for everybody. So. And I think it definitely is. Yeah. It definitely is. Um, so I was wondering, what do you think a small action we could each take to be more inspiring human beings is? Do you have a specific thing that you think, oh my gosh, if we could all do this one thing, the world would be so much better or the next generation would be so inspired? Well, if we could really listen and more authentically respond mm -hmm. to people when we listen to them, that would be an amazing thing, I think. I think we're, we're failing in hearing, listening and empathy and, um, and when we all, I think all of us know that when we respond from the heart, we have so much more power. So that's one thing I think absolutely for sure. I think it would also be really great to have more, more of the traits that women bring to power and to leadership um, that running our countries, running the world. And when I say that, and I don't mean that every single leader needs to be a woman because it's the traits that I find really important, the consensus building, the listening, the willingness, less competitive nature of conversations. Now that's not to say that there aren't some women out there who have some terrible, terrible leadership traits and we all know some of them. We've all heard, we've all seen them on TV. Um, but I think that that's some place that we all really could go as well. Yeah. So I got sort of lost in a good rabbit hole looking around on Moment Magazine on the website and all of the amazing things you're doing with the imprint and everything. And I was wondering, what is your, do you have one intention for all of those different things? Or did you create these sort of different, the imprint and the magazine? And you're just doing so much. And I was inspired just looking at the website. So I wondered what your intention was. We do have a beautiful that. website. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. You know, the original, the magazine originally started in 1975 with Ellie Wiesel and Leonard Fine, and it was a print magazine for America's Jews to have conversations about, you know, Jews in America and Israel, and um, and then it, and and Ellie was there for a year, and then or two, two years, and then Leonard La Label ran it for another till 86, and then it became part of biblical archaeology, and then it. It moved to Washington, D.C., and it was also a magazine. I, sometimes it was a little to the left. Sometimes it was pretty far to the right. Um, it kind of went, you know, all over the place. But when I took it over in uh, 2004, which is almost 20 years ago, I, it's become so much more. It's a, multi, it's a multimedia platform. It's like whatever happens in the world, we can address it. We may be addressing it through the magazine, the print magazine. We have completely different content on the web. We have newsletters. We have contests. We have our cartoon caption contest. We have our spice box contest. We have um, the Daniel Pearl Investigative Journalism uh, Program, which gives grants to journalists to cover prejudice anywhere around the world, not just Jewish, Jewish prejudice, not anti-Jewish prejudice. Um, we have a whole new program created to train journalists in the Middle East. 
to cover the Middle East. We have a fiction contest, but really even more than, in, in the last few years we've become, I think, so important in that we're really leading a lot of the civil discourse. We have this project called the Big Question Project, which Amy helps out a lot with, which is where we, we take a question and we really curate a spectrum of responses about, I mean, you have to, able, to be able to learn, you have to know what people think all over. And there's no such thing as debate anymore, especially in such a polarized country. Debate just polarizes more. We need to go beyond that, find nuances, and realize that there's, you know, there, the spectrum is sort of a, is not, is not just right to left. Let's look at it as a big circle and how it all fits together and so that we can understand how to expand our own thinking and to be able to be better listeners and better understanders. And I think we have to build up, the, rebuild the fabric of civil discourse. So I think Moment is really, works really hard to do that, whether it's on social media, whether it's in our newsletters, whether it's in the magazine, whether it's on events. We have this amazing program, by the way, called Moment Live. Every Tuesday at 4.30, we have an incredible, we're like, um, we're like the Stryker Center or the Smithsonian Center now. So, um, we have incredible programming. Like last week we had Ken Burns. This week I interviewed uh, Nina Totenberg about her book. Um, but there are conversations about culture, politics, theater, um, poetry, everything, so much. Um, and one of those projects that I've been doing is called the Wide River Project, where it's a conversation where we're looking into, the, Eric Ward, who is a civil rights leader, and I are hosting this conversation where we're looking into the relations, the complexities of the black Jewish relations relationship. Um, so there's just so much happening at Moment. We reach so many people through different ways. And I just, I think if I had to say one thing to sum it all up, it's creativity. Moment is a source of incredible creative thinking and programming and writing. And that's lacking. And one reason we can do that is because we're so small and we have such a small, there's no bureaucracy. <laughs> um, but creativity is really the most important thing we can bring to the world right now. And it's clear you've accomplished so much with all of your creative energy and ideas. And, and I think so many of us have those ideas or inspirations and then don't know what to do with them. And I wondered if you had, I mean, with all you've accomplished, or is there a rule or two or some small step people can take when they have this idea or this inspiration, but they don't know what to do next to help bring that idea to the world or to their family or to a bigger circle, their temple maybe? Well, you can always um, email editor at momentmag.com with your so ideas. So nice. And Almost then, no editor ever says that, so you should write that down. <laughs> yeah, really. And, um, and really, I mean, that's one of the reasons that we're, like, like last week, um, we, have, we have, you can be a premium member of Moment. And we had a Sherry Hour, our first Sherry Hour. It was virtual, where, of course, um, I was drinking, like, you know, super fortified water. <laughs> and she was, Amy was drinking Diet Coke. But we had, but it was so amazing because people came to the Sherry Hour, readers from across the country, and they had amazing ideas. And we had this great conversation. It was so creative. It was so, I, I had no idea what to expect. I thought, oh my gosh, nobody's going to have anything to say. We're just going to sit there all kind of blinking at each other on, on you know, on, on, on Zoom and R, on a Zoom. And it turns out it was just divine because it was so creative. So, um, anyways, that's uh, I, I forgot what no you did you was. did yeah. perfect because I think yeah. I think I think also being in community and in that creative energy creative energy is contagious which is why sometimes it's hard to write a book or get an idea off the ground when we're sitting at our desk by ourselves it's community yeah so one of the things that's so amazing about moment is the community and but it's community is so important for being creative and it's probably what I love most about I mean about Moment and about, it's just the amazing group of people. And there's so many different people who are part of it. And, and who, we have a number of volunteer senior editors who bring so much to Moment, including we have Robert Siegel who like left from, left when he retired from NPR, he, he now works at Moment. Um, but a lot of other people like him who maybe are less well known. 
But that brings so much energy. So then we have young people who are like interns, and then we have people who are in there. Well, we have a 98-year-old uh, senior editor who just moved to back to, to New York, and I'm going to have uh, meeting her on Wednesday for, for lunch. So, you know, they range, everybody ranges from, I'd say, 18 to 98. <laughs> now, that's fabulous because the conversation between different generations takes place all the time, and it keeps you so on your toes. You know, it's not like you're just relying on your kids to go, what are you talking about, mom? You know, it's like, that we're, I learned so much. It's so great. It's, we're always so informed. We don't always agree, but we, it doesn't matter. It's not about agreement. I love it. I was so inspired again being on the website. Can you just say what the website is just for oh, anybody? Thank you. Sure. It's um, momentmag.com. And you'll see, you can go and you can sign up. For, we have a number of amazing newsletters. And, and you can sign up for the register for the Moment Live program. And then every Sunday, you'll get a list of all the different programs that are coming. Like Sometimes, like this week, it's going to be on cooking, about um, Hanukkah cooking. So. I was so impressed. I was like, I'm going to sign up for everything. So thank you for that. So a few days ago, when we chatted very briefly on Zoom, we were talking about ritual and something you had written for The Last Moment magazine. And I was really touched by that and wondered if we could talk a little bit so important in Jewish culture and, and in families to pass down those rituals. And I just wondered if you could share a little bit about that article before we go to everyone else's questions. Great. Well, there... So... Um, Last December 5th, which happened to be the last night of Hanukkah, I think, th I think I'm not getting my days mixed up, um, we, I, we had a, I was talking about the book and at a gallery in, in Washington, D.C., in Georgetown, and I invited a rabbi to come because it was the last night of Hanukkah, and we lit the candles. And after she lit the can, after the kid, there were kids who lit the candle, uh, candles. We had. Um, she said a, she gave a blessing, and she actually read a little part of the book, and it was so amazing, and it was also it was incredibly moving, and it was about remembering great w women on the last night of Hanukkah, and so I thought about this all year, and I thought, well, let's take the eighth night. You know, Hanukkah has two women who are peripherally related to them to the ho holiday, Han Hannah and Judith. They're really interesting, especially Judith, I think, is really interesting. Um, but this is about every, every eighth night thinking about some great women. They don't have to be Jewish, but they could be Jewish, um, of history who are, who are not remembered, who we need to be remembered more, and, um, and, 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 and bringing them to mind, and then all sharing who they are. So I think that's really important. And then saying the blessing. Which, which is this sort of blessing that Rabbi took from the book. So I, I wrote the whole thing down, and it's called The Eighth Night. And um, it's going to be, I'll put it up on the website. That's yeah. great. Thank you. It's actually, I think there are moments here in the resource uh, area, which I haven't been to yet. And if you take, if you go look at the last issue called Eighth Night, the last cover of the last issue, it's on there. You could take that, and then it's, I write about it in there. So. Perfect. Thank you. So I think we'll go to audience questions now because I could ask a million, but um, yes, go ahead. Hi. So um, as much as I'm interested in Ruth Ginsburg, the Supreme Court Justice, I was also interested in her relationship, professional relationship with um, the other, what's his name? Scalia. It's such a great question. Thank you. Um, so, and I just was actually interviewed Nina Totenberg last week, and we were talking a lot about this because she was also friends with Scalia. So, I think that the example of Justice Ginsburg and Justice Scalia being really good friends is something that we all need to 
really take to heart. These are two people who couldn't have disagreed more on the law, and even stylistically in how they made their arguments and how they, they talked. But they bonded through their kind of love of life and love of food and music. And we have to have, in a, in a, and especially in a polarized era, it's really important to find bonds, to make create bonds with people we disagree with. And those bonds may be about a sports team or our favorite kinds of shoes. It doesn't really matter what it is. But it's not until you have a long-term trusting relationship with somebody that maybe you might have some kind of impact they might come to understand you, you might come to understand their opinions or their points of view. And I talk about this in the call to action. It's something that, that kids need to do and people of all ages need to do. Because when was the last time you, just, you, went, you, know, you had an argument with somebody and you won it? Maybe, you, it, let's say, maybe you're married, maybe you won it, you, you know, an argument briefly with your spouse. But generally, you really don't win arguments. It doesn't really work that way. <laughs> and, you know, and in these days, like I say, arguing just pushes people farther apart. But creating relationships with them and you know, choosing, as Justice Ginsburg's mother-in-law once told her, to be occasionally deaf. You know, <laughs> that doesn't mean that you're like, you know, it doesn't mean that you're agreeing with them. It doesn't mean you want to be occasionally deaf if somebody says something really violent or something, somebody behaves so extremely. But I mean, sometimes you just can ignore something and focus on what it is that brings you together. Yes, here. I couldn't hear what you said, I'm sorry. Could you hear it? Could you speak up a little bit? I didn't catch the first part. How would you say Okay, let me just get closer so I can hear you. New women who are heroes versus all the generation of heroes. How are the women today different? Ooh, what an interesting question. Um, how are um, kind of new he women, he female hero heroes today different from heroes of the older generation? We have so much more community. There are these the women in these books. This book were so isolated, really, and they had to work so much harder to get where they are, where, get where they got. And very, some of them had supportive families, but the vast majority of them had, you know, families who thought, you know, either disowned them or thought they were nuts. Um, but there were some that had supportive families, like, you know, Lillian Wald and Emma Lazarus, people who came from, like, pretty comfortable backgrounds. Your parents were perfectly fine with them being poets when everybody else was getting married and having children. Um, but I would say now, you know, we have a, there's, there's such a strong sense of um, solidarity. We have so many women that we can look at who, you know, currently and in the past. So we've built on, we've built on that. So I, I think that's maybe the main difference. I think I would say it's, it's easier for us today. I think with the evolution of technology, too, for better or worse, everybody can say anything. And I think that's, that, has, that has really helped because we don't need permission from anybody else to help lift our voices. We can do it. We have more avenues and outlets. Yes, I mean, we, have, we live in a world of just such diverse methods of communication. Yeah. I'm not sure that social media is the best way to be out there doing this. I mean, obviously, a lot of young people have... A lot of people are spending a lot of time being influencers, mm -hmm. um, but again, that again, the, the downside to social media is that's very passive compared to, compared to actually going out and you know doing other things. I think. I think there's a question here. Yes. Um, you might have mentioned this before, but how did you come up with the number thirty-three? And how yeah. did you meet that? Like, was there a commonality you were looking for? Such a great question, really. So. You know, it was so easy to keep coming up with women. And even, even in um, July and August of 2020, before Justice Ginsburg died, she was sending me more names of people. Oh, well, include this woman, include that woman. Um, so basically, the, 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 and I talk about this in the book, 
these are women who really defied the expectations of their times. I think that every single one of them defied the expectations of their times in some way, and then went on either to do something amazing in their field or really pave the way for other people, other women to do that. Um, but there were so many women. There's so many women lost to history. So we still have, I still, you know, we had just chosen 150, but, you know, 117 are sitting there, and I'm sure we could have chosen another, you know, million. Um, although it's really hard to get, um, we're gonna, it's really, really hard to um, kind of find real research about a lot of the women. They're just like myths about women. So, you know, there were a number of women we looked into about writing about them, but there just wasn't enough to go on. Um, you know, I wasn't be able to go to like to, I wasn't doing primary research like, oh, I could go to Yemen and go to this library. I mean, even if I could do that, I wasn't going to be going to Yemen at this time and going to the library. There probably isn't a library, you know, that's accessible to me. But um, so we ended up with women that we could find out information about. And then, of course, well, we meant to get the 36 women, and then Random House had that in the title, and when we only got to 33, um, I just suggest they take out, they just say, um, just say Jewish women to inspire everyone and take out the 36. And they, somebody in marketing insisted that we had to have it say 33. And I was like, but 33 doesn't have the same significance, you know, in, as 36. And they were like, well, we don't care. So I often just have made up, actually there's, there's a number of uh, just made up different reasons. For a while I was just making jokes. Well, it's like the Holy Trinity. But <laughs> Um, somewhere, some, someone actually did explain to me that there was some numerological significance to 33, but I've forgotten it, so. And there's a significance now, even if there wasn't, just because yeah. it's in this book. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? We get... Okay, perfect. Yeah, go ahead. You can have another question. I'll give you one. <laughs> You know, there were actually some women in, like, Renaissance Italy. Um, I mean, I think one could say that um, Salome Alexandra, whose I think Hebrew name is Sholemit, uh, was definitely from sort of this Greek era, um, and because Greek, Roman Roman era, because right after the Romans were already there, you know, in Judea, and then shortly after she died, um, Judea no longer was independent. Um, but I have to go back and look at the list, so I don't. I don't know. I can't. I can't enter that one. Any? Yes. Go ahead. I know that part of being a journalist is doing research. A journalist. Were you more attracted to the, just the idea of writing and then being drawn into doing research, or did it all kind of come together? Were you good at the research part, or just more into? I know it's a really interesting question. Um, I think the curiosity is the main thing that gets you to me. I've just always been ridiculously curious to the point where my parents thought, you know, I, I was nuts. Um, and because they don't, you know, when growing up in a sort of conformist New Jersey world, like there's just a lot of things you just shouldn't know about. And you shouldn't ask about. So I always asked all the I always asked all the questions and was often got no answer, but I just asked them. So I think curiosity came first, but I also, you know, love writing and love and love art and drawing. So those were and reading. And they all but they're all so I guess in a way maybe you're asking reading and then I mean curiosity and then the expression part. And so I think maybe in me they're equal, but I think all of us have a lot of that. And being a journalist, I didn't really think about being a journalist, journalist till later in a way because it kind of fit some of those things together. But then as I discovered at my first couple jobs where I was working for a wire service and then working for uh, at the City News Bureau in Chicago, is that it really wasn't about writing. The kind of writing that people did at newspapers and wire services was really not good writing. And um, I had to kind of unlearn that again. 
So, you know, and then you, then I realized that there, there is room for good writing in, in journalism. But in the beginning, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't in those places, so. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here and inspiring all of us with this beautiful book.